Now, for coloring this, I am going to be using, uh, I use Zebra Pen products. I am a Zebra Pen Artist Ambassador, but I use the products because I like them. Uh, they ask you to do like three pictures a year and promote their social media broadcasts a little bit. They really don't ask a whole lot. So I could get away with not using their products, but I like them, so I use them for almost everything. This is the Mild Liner. It's actually a highlighter, but I like to use it to color with. I'll be using some Sarasa Fine Liners. I probably should be showing you these tips here so you can get an idea of what... Okay, that's When it says Fine Liner, it is a Fine Liner. Uh, I'm not sure exactly... I should know what size that is, but I can't remember offhand. Going back to the mild liner, you actually have two tips. There's your standard highlighter tip, and then you have a bullet point tip. Let's see. And I'm actually going to use some colored pencils. This is the Zensations Mechanical Pencil. Ah, there's the writing. And where you can just push the tip. And I drew this with the Zensations Technical Drawing Pen because it's waterproof. I believe I already discussed this, but it bears repeating. The mild liners are wet, so they can reactivate even when things are waterproof, if you don't let it dry first, it can reactivate the color. They're self-cleaning in that if they do pick up something, you don't ruin the pen, but you do need to take some care to make sure that you aren't going over pen lines that are going to smear on you. So I'm going to start out here with Let's get it the broad areas, and then I'm going to shut up because this will take a little bit of time, and I'm going to speed it up. So. Okay, I wanted to show you a couple of things here. For one, as you look, you notice that I'm not coloring this in solidly. I don't want to color it in solidly. This is like a, you know, fluorescent yellow. And even though this is sort of um, primitive art, cartoony sort of looking, I don't want to leave the ground yellow. I am going to be going over it with another color. And by leaving these gaps, there's going to be a variation as I go and I blend it. It means that there will be slightly different colors. They won't be totally different and it'll just be kind of small, but that will add some interest. It's, it's an easy way to add some interest when you're blending different colors. It's just don't make it solid and it, it's actually easier to do that way. The other thing, and this goes back since I am doing this as a review, um, you see that it did reactivate the ink a little bit. So that's going to be a combination of the Hanamuli hand lettering paper. It's the formulation, uh, very bright slick, plus the quality of the mild liner pens. That kind of goes to learning tools. It, it really doesn't reflect poorly on either product. It's just the fact that because you're, you, this is like formulated for the pen to get that bright crisp line and keep the colors brilliantly, there's, and it being so smooth, the colors don't sink in the way that they might on a softer, thicker paper. So <clears throat> you could use this exact same pen and marker on another paper and it might not happen. It's something where you do have to learn what your tools will do and what they won't do. I 
still going forward knowing this would go ahead and use this combination I just take a little bit more care or I might even deliberately use that smearing quality some people um, like to do that when they're painting or drawing because it gives it sort of a soft misty sort of look so when you see something like that what you need to do is think how you can use it uh, I don't know that I will use it in this particular drawing I haven't really considered it and I hadn't drawn it with that in mind so it may come to me I may think of something where oh gee I can in fact just even talking about that I think I might use it a little bit for some shading on these guys I'm gonna make them pink okay I want the bullet tip and now what I will do here is do I'm, I'm randomly deciding that my light is coming in this direction from the upper left so I want the cleanest color to be over on the left and to the center I'm taking some care I'm not avoiding it, it the ink doesn't it isn't like oh gee you every time you touch it 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 just smears all over the place you can go over it it's just that there ever so often there will be some place where the ink probably because I applied more ink uh, than other areas and so I ended up getting a, a little smear now okay yeah and but if I take it and really work on it I can pick that up but what I have to do the trick is really kind of rubbing the color in and there I've got a little bit of shading for these guys um, and the color's not a whole lot different than it was elsewhere as I said these are self-cleaning and I'm going to just use the back here you can see that there's a little bit of the black on there and now it's pretty clean okay so the same thing over here and I am touching these it, it's how much of the color that you put down that will say yes it will smear or no it won't smear now see over here I, I'm not getting quite as much of a smearing so I probably didn't put down as much black ink when I was doing these okay so you can get a little bit of shading there okay so that's taking advantage of the characteristics of the the pen in question now gray is kind of a boring color elephants are pretty much gray what I'm going to do is draw lines can you see that well enough and I'm going fairly light here again I'm not going solid I don't do solid colors very often I honestly don't and I think what I'm actually using here is the gold which is sort of a brownish gray <laughs> I thought I had picked up the gray and I don't see it here so and I picked this one up by accident but it's close enough to what I want actually a prettier color than the gray would be anyway and 
Now I'm getting in and doing a little bit more solid around the eyes because I want to sort of put some emphasis there and that's one way I can do that. And you can see here I'm, I'm doing a little bit of shading as I go along. A little bit darker, um, going a little bit different direction with the lines. Now this Sarasa fine liner and this paper are really made for each other. They just get in there and the pen glides on there. If I change my pressure, I can get a lot of just different tones. This is, these Sarasa fine liners are what I use to draw my step outs. And as I believe I mentioned earlier, I really like using this paper for doing the step outs. I get nice clear crisp lines that scan well. And half the time I've just been drawing my example right beneath the step outs depending on how many steps that I have to take. Now I thought I would discuss a little bit about you see here where I overlap a lot of people when they use markers or pens they get upset because you get the what you know they consider it to be streaky because of the overlap is if you go over the same section more than once even though you're using the same color, where it overlaps it's going to be darker. And there isn't a whole lot that you can do to avoid that. So again, it's using the characteristics of your tool as you figure out how to use it. And we've already discussed that the elephant tends to be sort of a wrinkly critter. So this is just going to be sort of the wrinkles in his skin. There are some other things. When I color the next elephant, I will use a different method and show you kind of how that works for using the pen, where you don't exactly avoid the streaks, but you change the nature of them. I'm going to leave part of this ear uncolored because it's a lighter area. Now, this might surprise you a little bit, but the so-called white elephant is actually usually a very pale gray with lots of pink areas. And pink patches on an elephant are really pretty common, especially the Indian elephant. I don't think you see it very often on an African elephant, but your Indian elephant quite often has. And now you see at least partially when I do this these lines I come through more solid color and unless you're looking at it closely and I get a little further away you don't really even notice the lines so much. This is one of the ways of kind of blending color and since markers and pens of this sort tend to have very intense color and they all tend to be of the same value that's a lightness and darkness so it isn't so much yes yellow is lighter and in fact I use yellow a lot just because of the lightness of it but most of the your your other colors just tend to be the same value unless you really really get intense and in saturating the color in certain areas and then it tends to just kind of get dull so 
this is one way that you can change your values and make things look lighter is like by doing this sort of hatching is you let some of the paper show through all right for the other elephant here I was going to show you a different technique and in this case this takes a little bit longer and it's a little bit harder on the hand I do use it a lot though and that's squircling you've probably heard me talk about that in the past in essence it's just making little scribbly circles and well you don't get the streakiness because you've got a lot of little circles you still have some of the paper showing through uh, and I mean you can keep squircling in one area until it gets a lot darker it gives you a whole different effect now I normally would not have used this effect for an elephant because yeah you you give more get more of an impression of something that's either marbled or maybe woolly um, which elephants aren't so it, it really isn't the technique I would use most of the time for an elephant and you can get I'm going to get really large the squircling can look really messy at, at especially if you get these really large random circles but again when it comes to blending those larger messy circles can be very very effective and they won't look that messy once you've started using other colors or even if I now went over this with the same color and maybe saturated it a little heavier in some places you get that kind of a layered effect it's very effective Okay. This time I'm going to use purple. We're going to sort of, my hope is that we'll gray it up. I want the bullet tip. Now I wouldn't have to use the circular motion. I am using that same motion since I started that way. I'm actually not applying very much pressure. This is one of the things that's really hard to... I mean, there's no way you can show how much pressure is being used. But since this is intense, I don't want him to come out, you know, looking like he's been dyed purple or something. I want this to kind of turn into more of a, a grayish brown or purplish brown. So I'm being very careful. We talked before about how wet the mild liners are and, and so on, but you notice when I smear, it doesn't go anywhere. What does happen there is it gets more of a smoother polished look because I've done that, but even though you can reactivate colors on this paper, it doesn't smear. I've had, you can see I'm left-handed and you can also see I've got my hand resting on the paper while I'm doing this, which is which is very bad practice by the way. Uh, <laughs> I tend to do it, I try and not, just because so often it can smear um, and it's also one of the things I'm doing here is I'm getting the oils from my hand onto the paper so Later, when I go to color in areas, I may find that I'm getting little spots, and that will be because I was resting my hand on it. Um, I've had no trouble with that. That's another one of the reasons why I like doing my step outs on this paper, is because it just does not smear. 
I shouldn't say that so positively because then somebody will use it and it'll promptly smear. There are things that can affect it, you know, the, te the temperature, maybe you've just got sweatier palms or more, you know, some people just have more oily hands. There are things that can affect it, but I personally have never had it smear on me and my suspicion is that most people will not. Okay, so this actually, I don't know if you've had a chance to really look at elephants very much, but they have, tend to have a lot of patchy areas, patchy color, uh, especially, again, the Asian more so, I think, than the African, and even though he's more African looking, uh, it, in the end, that sort of uh, squirkling I think was pretty effective for him. I think I liked it better than I do the hatching. So I'm going to do my next elephant that way too. So let's get funny with this guy. He's in the distance, remember, so we're not going to have as much detail. And I'm going to make him actually be a white elephant so he's going to be mainly pink here and I'm making my squircles pretty large um, that's something else that if it's in the distance it's going to be lighter in most cases there are atmospheric things and nothing <laughs> you notice that there's always some exception okay, I'm going to now switch to the colored pencil even though I have blue I may have to add back in some mild liner now the colored pencil it especially over this the mild liner I'm having to put a little bit of pressure to get much in the way of color but this is a pretty effective way of using colored pencil for this paper because you get some nice subtle color and because you're going over a more intense color to begin with you're not going to have to worry about layering um, usually with colored pencil you build up your color and build it up and build it up and the color pencil looks good on this paper it's just there's no tooth so once you put some down you can't keep layering and usually you do that with colored pencil as you get these layers and layers of nice rich color okay and that's one of the things I did note with this paper that with pencil or the colored pencil it doesn't the color doesn't keep coming off later it it it's like once it's on there it's set uh, da, da, da. I'm gonna use just a little bit of the purple here the other thing that I've noted with this paper that is it's very good is that it doesn't do a whole lot of um, pilling is some of these like with the mild liners or if you were using something like your Tombos you have probably encountered the situation where all of a sudden you got this little bits of stuff in whether it's the paper or the fabric from the marker itself both will tend to kind of tear off if you saturate the paper very much. I, again, it's a combination of which particular markers you're using and some colors are worse than others. But you just it, there's no way really of avoiding that particular problem is you will get your pilling and I've yet to have any pilling on this paper even though I have saturated it in some situations. And 
where these mild liners and this paper work well together is the fact that the mild, some of the mild liner colors, it just depends on which ones you're using, tend to be a little more dull on some papers, which isn't necessarily bad because sometimes you want dull. I, I, I like that because a lot of markers don't have enough dull colors for my taste. Um, but you don't want all dull color. It's sort of something that you want to use as a highlight rather than to have a lot of that. And that's one of the things that I like is on this paper they aren't quite as dull. You, you still have it. I wanted sort of a counterpoint here for these trees and that's what I mean. You know it's not like it's a, a really super ugly color or you know, some dull sort of seems to be a negative word in art, but it's actually something that's very necessary. Uh, let's see here. I am going to use, no, I'll use my fine liner to do these tree trunks. Now, I've done a very rapid set of lines. It was almost solid at the top, but in fact it isn't quite solid. I'm just doing the lines very quickly here. So they're darker, closer together at the top, and then I sort of start stretching them out. And I, I'm not lifting my pen, so I'm, I'm doing kind of a zigzag here. You probably really can't tell it because I'm doing so fast, but that is in fact what I'm doing. Now here I will make it solid. And I'm going to sort of, I'm still, I'm doing a sort of oval. I'm taking advantage of the fact that you get streaks. And in fact, I'm going to go back and, and do them darker so that I end up with rings on my trunk and because I want to sort of enhance that elephant foot feel I'm going to do circles there with a little bit of solid in between and that's going to, not going to be quite as effective here because this would be more in shadow so I've just done some hatched lines but I will do the circle for the feet Speaking of the feet, I'm going to use these guys. They're all going to have nice little pink toes, which is not going to be the case, I don't believe. There needs to kind of be a balance, since I've done these yellow here. Three is sort of a magic number. You notice I had three elephants, three trees. In Western culture, we're sort of trained to look for threes in our compositions. And I, there's also sort of a balance in where things are at in the threes. So sort of a rule of thumb, if you have one color that's fairly dominant and in the pink in this picture even though there isn't a whole lot of it it's much brighter and it's much more dominant so I'm putting it there so that I'll sort of have this uh, line of, of the, the colors I don't want them exactly but it, it sort of leads the eye around one problem here though is this is in the distance and I don't want it to be a focal point. So I, I want to dull. Again that, that nice word dull there. I want to dull it down so that it's not as bright. And I'm going to use this as sort of a, an ochre color. 
Yeah, that's not going to dull it enough. But it does add some nice interest in there. I'll put that. And you see, I just push that and my lead advances. I'm going to use this for my background color. Because as I said earlier, I'm not going to leave it to be this nice fluorescent color. And again, I'm not trying to make this solid. I want the yellow to come through and I will in fact be adding yet a third color. Now I'm using long strokes and I'm not going willy-nilly with it. I'm trying to uh, convey a little bit of direction to, you know, usually when you look at stuff, the soil or whatever it is, it has a little bit of a flow, a direction to it. And so I'm, I'm started over here and keeping my strokes going all in this direction. I could, if I wanted to sort of imply that, that things were coming down this way, I could have gone this way over here and then changed it to this way over here. But you don't want to like be a little here and then a little this way and then a little that way. You, you want some cohesion to the way that your strokes are going. Now as I get closer, I'm making my strokes a little more straight. There's still some curve there and I'm going to go a little bit heavier. Again this is in the distance so don't want it to be as bright. And okay. Now I've done my strokes kind of going in here, but then I'm going to start curving this out and flattening it here. This is going to be very subtle and you won't even see it in some cases depending on how closely someone's looking at it, but it gives the impression that the land goes upward in this area and then sort of flattens out a little bit here. I don't want it to like the impression of hills but it, it just sort of gives it a little bit more of dimension and sort of makes it where it's just not all one big solid mass all going exactly the same way. It just breaks things up a little bit. Now I'm getting really loose down here because I'm going to switch to another color. I want that yellow in there, but I don't want it to be predominant at this point. But let's go back to the graying of that pink in the background. And I think I'm just going to use the gray, it's, uh, this brownish stuff that I've been using. I probably could use the purple too, but I'm hatching here. I'm keeping my hatching wider. Up, the lines are, are further apart than they are for the trunk. And it doesn't matter too much if the trunks get swallowed up a little bit because you've got the same color going back here. Because in the distance you probably wouldn't notice the trunks quite as much. I, you know, had a little bit of a notion of what I was going to do. 
You see me trying to smear it there because I do that a lot and I wasn't able to smear it. Uh, uh, <clears throat> what I was saying was that the trouble with coming in and starting this, I, you know, I had a little bit of an idea of what I was going to do, but really hadn't thought it all the way through, which tends to be the way that I draw <laughs> when I'm doing this sort of thing, is I just go with the flow. But it does mean that I wasn't as prepared. Um, I would have had some other colors here to help with the graying of what I was doing here. Uh, I keep trying to smear it. <clears throat> but uh, I, I kind of like just going with the flow. I like seeing what happens. I like being surprised by the result as much as anybody else is. And it's sort of like you have a bag of tricks, but it does mean that you do have situations where you go, oh, I wish I had done this or I wish I had done that because you didn't plan ahead. So, uh, add a little bit of shading here. I didn't do that at all. Okay. And now I'll use this color pencil here. And I'm going to do short strokes. Whoops, I'm off the camera, aren't I? I'm going to do short strokes. And apply more of a grass coverage. And I don't want to keep going just in lines because that would create sort of an unnatural streaking so now I'm going to do sort of fan shapes here and I will do that sort of at random before I go any further. And you notice this is partly because I'm in an area now where I already put some colored pencil down. And I'm not necessarily following along where I was doing those long strokes and directions. What I'm now implying is not the general shape of the landscape but some of the um, growth that is on the landscape so my strokes are different than they were when I was just sort of laying out the ground itself and you see sort of some, you know, really short grass sometimes it sort of goes along the the ground. So your direction of your strokes is very important to the overall picture. It, it, it's very subtle, but it's one of those things that can make the difference between you know something that looks nice and something that it, you look at it and you can't quite figure out why am I not happy with this. And sometimes it's because you've just got, you know, your solid strokes all going one direction or they're, they're going so many different directions that it just confuses the eye. And I want to use quite a bit of this green grassy color, but I don't want it to entirely cover up the lighter green yellows that I have there. 
Do a little bit more of the sort of creeper sort of coverage here. So by the way that I have blended my colors and the strokes that I have put in, I've implied that this area here is a little bit more open, that you've got some grasses growing along in here, uh, more, you know, sort of creeper sort of coverage going on in here. Don't avoid, like, you tendency is like to go around and leave kind of a white space here because, you know, oh, you know, I don't want to ruin the color. Even if you did get a little bit more green or something in here, break some of this up so that it, it goes in between so that it looks like this plant is part of what's happening back here. You don't want to, you know, separate it. Sometimes people get afraid to get in there and, and sort of, continue around they just want to separate it instead because they're afraid of messing things up and truthfully it's a little better to have overlapping color than to just get that white aura or paler aura around it uh, and again I, I <laughs> shifted gears didn't I <clears throat> more open area grasses a little bit more open here it's paler uh, there's a little bit of a rise in here. This is kind of sloping, so you think that you know it's maybe not as flat as these more open areas. So you can see there's quite a bit that you can do by the direction, the length, and the intensity of the color that you put down. Um, really kind of simple tricks but people and, and sometimes just having solid really works well too but you can be more flexible more variable by deliberately controlling your direction and even even from a distance you don't notice as much but you do you see those lighter areas and you just kind of get an impression of things happening in the background. You don't want it to be something that's that's so noticeable that it pulls away from the main focuses, which are these elephants. And I think that once we put a little bit of sky back here, that we're going to be done. Okay, get the blue in there. And I'm going to add just a touch of blue here. That will help dull it again and tie it into the sky. And also it kind of gives the feel of it reflecting the color of the sky. It won't hurt to put some blue here too. That's close enough. Okay. Now, the streaking... I'm going to get it because there will be a little bit of overlap. But what I'm doing here is, you see I'm making kind of squiggles. And by doing that, you're kind of implying the little stream, you know how clouds get that, become streamers. And if I do have the streaks, the overlaps, they become part of this uh, sort of pattern of squiggles. 
and it looks pretty natural. And there, there are other ways that I can use the overlap. That's the way I'm choosing it today. It gives it a slightly stormy look. Uh, not like a, a really tr heavy rainstorm or something, but you know, maybe a lot of moisture in the air, some drizzle. Um, I could even leave a little bit of area here for clouds. I'm kind of missing my ability to smear. I like to smear a lot. I like soft edges. Uh, so I like to smear a lot in it. You, you can't smear much on this paper. And notice I'm even though I'm running the risk of getting some blue in there or, or you know picking up the black ink or something, I did get in there right up close. I didn't deliberately leave white around it trying to avoid touching it okay I, I thought the sky would finish it but one other thing that we really need to put in here I don't want to get too involved with it but the elephants need to have some shading my lights coming this direction I established that before so my shadows are going to go more in this area and, and I'm going to you know, normally I would I would do a little bit more of big long shadows because I like doing those but this video has gone on long enough so I'm just vaguely picking up the shapes here shadows differ according to the time of day so you really don't have to do anything that's too involved but these shadows help with all the color the lines are not enough to really tie these guys to the to the ground keep them from floating so you just about have to have these shadows um. And now, because, as I was saying, there's a little bit of a raise, rise here, is you're going to have a little bit of shadowing. Because the light's going to come along, it hits the side of this rise here, throwing the bottom of this rise ah, into some shadow. And you've got like these various grasses, and they're gonna they're gonna have some shadows, and blades of grass. I'm sorry. I hopefully not too much of this has been off camera. Get involved with the drawing and forget to keep watching to see where it's at. Hopefully, I'll get better with that as I keep doing these videos. Okay, let's take a look at that. Oh, yeah. I'm sort of going at random to where I put these shadows, and yet I'm really not going at, at random. Partly what's driving what I'm doing here is trying to get a balance of where the shading is. Part of it is I'm I'm looking at it and thinking okay where would the light be hitting and where would the shadows go but above and beyond that there is sort of a, a driving need to like gee I've got 
lots of shadow here but I don't have enough shadow over here I, you know it makes this look unbalanced and that's something that comes after with time you'll probably find a little bit of it in yourself because you're kind of tra trained to look for things like that in, in the world I, you see it every day when you see the sun out and everything is bright you know it even though you don't really know it, it, it it's a, a passive knowledge and trying to use it actively isn't always that easy but it is one of the things that you develop you need to start looking at your work because you're going to do a lot of work everyone does where they look at it and it's like I don't like this but I don't know why I don't like it and that's one of the things to look for is that sense of balance and the sense of when the light hits something you know, if, if I've got my light coming here and everywhere else, it's really light here, but you've got one thing where, you know, maybe I have made a really dark blob here on this, the back of this elephant, and it, that would just draw the eye. And it just, your brain would say something's wrong here. So those are the things to kind of look for. It's that sense of balance. You don't want anything that's like, just terrifically darker than everything else. Looking at this in the camera from a distance, I would say I got these tails a little too dark because, I mean, really, tails should not be the focus. <laughs> but since they're dark, you tend to notice them. It does make a little bit of a uh, trail here. If I made something else darker here, it would they would help lead the eye. So I'm going to do that just because I happen to notice it. And I'm doing something here I wouldn't normally do, which I am using pen over colored pencil because the wax and colored pencils will ruin your pen. But since with this paper it sort of seems to set the color, I'm feeling a little more free to do that. I don't recommend that you do it. Different pencils have more uh, amounts of wax, so you could end up ruining a pen doing that. Uh, I'll I'll take the chance on sacrificing a pen because I I want to achieve that bit of balance there. I've got three places that are darker. It's still probably not the best situation in that. This lead elephant here really should be my focus. I think he still is what you're, the thing you're going to see the most with all, that pink is going to sort of draw the eye there. Okay, so Hanamula hand lettering pad. I used a mild liner, colored pencils, technical pen. And the colors, as you can see, are... are nice and bright. Uh, I did use some dull colors. They tend to be on this paper a little bit brighter than they would be on other papers. But everything goes on here. There's no pilling. That's something that since the mild liners are wet and that's going to be any highlighter. You know like if you're just kind of highlighting a word you just go across once. You don't usually apply a whole lot of pressure and so the fact that it's wet doesn't really affect the highlight itself very much and you might not notice it but when you start using a highlighter for something with this large area you're much more likely to get some kind of pilling um, you might get more smearing with this paper it actually does very well it does activate the waterproof a little bit but it isn't a whole lot and you can take advantage of that. I use this paper every week for my fun and easy landscape step outs. I like it very much for that. It is a hand lettering paper. It even on the inside has some examples 
of fonts so that you can try those out. Oddly enough, for a review of a hand lettering paper, I didn't do any lettering. And lettering isn't my thing. I can do okay, but I'm, I'm not the world's best by any means. But I think it's a highly flexible paper for using for many other things, and I think it would be kind of a shame to only use it for lettering. So, if this is the type of thing you like to do, or if you are someone who wants to do lettering, I think it would be great for... On my blog, I have a page that shows where you can buy Hanamula paper, and if you're interested in this, you can find it there. I will put the link to it down below in the description and I think I've covered most of the things. Yes. Have a good day.